Writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Rachel, Promotion Specialist at Kobo Writing Life. I'm Laura, Kobo Writing Life's Author Engagement Manager. I'm Tara, Director of Kobo Writing Life for English Language. And I'm Terrence, KWL's Content Coordinator. On this episode of the podcast, the four of us sat down to discuss what we saw in indie publishing and publishing in general in 2022 and what we hope to see in 2023 and beyond. We had a lot of fun talking about just all things books, audiobooks, AI, TikTok. And we would love to know if you agree with our predictions for next year or if you think we are wildly off base. So be sure to let us know and we hope you enjoy. Okay. So what did you guys notice in indie publishing trends in 2022, what really stood out to you? I'm going to jump in and say the continued growth of audiobooks. We have seen so many more people investing in audio, and I think audiobooks will continue to grow and have continued to grow through 2022. And obviously the advent of AI audio has really assisted that, but I think the growth of audiobooks is a trend that we've seen since what, like 2018, and it just continues to grow, which I think is really fun. You're making it sound like audiobooks never existed. They're no, like... but okay, listen, going from books on tape. Yeah. In, yeah. I listened to books on tape when I was a kid, but I just mean like the continued boom of audiobooks that we've seen. Because I think when podcasts first started to really come out, that then brought people more into listening on the go. And then audiobooks are continuing that trend. And I just have noticed more and more audiobooks. Thanks, Tara. No, I think it was, um, I wrote, was reading somewhere, they were comparing audiobooks now, maybe it was the hot sheet that I read this in, but to podcasts a few years ago where people, like even in the peak of Serial, were just sort of like, oh, this is the most popular podcast will ever be. And it's times 10 since then now. So the audiobook growth will be something similar and kind of continuing in that way, which I think is interesting. I think we're just so much more like on the move than we used to be. And like audiobooks is just a way to like continue reading like in the car, like on the train and that kind of thing. So I feel like that's also kind of why we're seeing this big boom, especially now that we can actually get outside after COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think the audio links into what I think I noticed as the indie publishing trend is the subscription platforms kind of expanding. We're seeing more and more offerings for audiobooks and then the likes of Kobo Plus with audiobooks in Canada, which allows authors to opt their books into a non-exclusive subscription service. So as a customer, you can have like all you can listen to, all you can read, or you can have the option of just like buying your book. So I think that's been really interesting to see how well like the non-exclusivity part of subscriptions is doing. So it's just kind of opening up a whole other avenue to readers of both ebooks and audiobooks. And just kind of to combine both of our answers again, well, I think with having offerings like Kobo Plus and then also the advent of AI audio, audiobooks are becoming more accessible to both authors and to different types of listeners because the folks who buy into subscriptions tend to be different than those who buy, like purchase books a la carte. And so I think that we're just going to continue to see more and more people adopting listening to audiobooks as it becomes more accessible to be created and to listen. Especially as the AI gets better and better. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I know it's quite good. There'll always be, I think the narrator part, like, especially when you think about like romance is probably like dual narrator, or at least like a talented narrator that is doing a male and female part or something like that. And I know that the AI is probably being developed to that point, but I like the option that it gives the choice. Like I think in a, sorry to go into the future, Terrence, but like in a future scenario, I see a place where they live together, (laughs) where it's like people have the option of like the narrated or the sort of AI driven one, depending on, on what you're kind of price or reading preference is. But I know, Rach, you've said before as well that like, if you're listening to audiobooks in anything higher than one speed, then you're not really listening for the nuance of what the narrator is doing. Absolutely. And I also think that as good as AI gets, I mean, I'm not talking like sci-fi future, like, you know, data on Star Trek that good, but you're never going to be able to replace like a full cast, full production audiobook. And that audience will always be there. And I think those audiobooks will always be there. But I think you're right. We're going to see more choice in what audio experience you get for the listeners like me who just listen on a fast speed and aren't really there for the 
like character and voice acting experience versus those who are. I like that you found a way to bring Star Trek into the call. Only took me about five minutes. Yeah, I think it's, Star it's interesting what you mentioned about not listening for the character necessarily, because I think a lot of people, I, I know myself included, I listen to audiobooks while I'm doing other things. <laughs> it's kind of something to have on in the background and to enjoy while you're, you know, just living your life. So yeah, like the AI audiobooks for sure will make it more accessible for folks who are, you know, listening in that way. Question for my own curiosity for all of you. Do you listen to podcasts differently than you listen to audiobooks? Do you treat them differently or do you treat them the same? I treat them very similarly, but I think that's because most of the audiobooks I listen to are nonfiction and most of the podcasts I listen to are also nonfiction. But I don't usually listen to podcasts on 1.25 speed, whereas I will listen to audiobooks faster which is interesting. And I don't know if that's because in audiobooks, narrators will consciously try to speak more slowly in order to have like, to make sure all the words are clear for those who are listening. Whereas in podcasts, a lot of the podcasts I listen to are like fast and snappy pop culture podcasts. So they move quickly anyways. But other than the listening speed, I listen to them very similarly, doing the same tasks. Like Terrence, I tend to have them on while I'm doing something else. I find that I pay more attention to an audiobook. I guess it depends on what the content of the podcast is. But to me, the podcast is more of like the background noise. Sometimes I put them on to fall asleep to, you got to pick the most boring stuff to listen to while you're falling asleep. But then if it's like an audiobook, like I guess the most recent one I listened to is, was Unreconciled by Jesse Wente, which is probably like, you know, it's kind of serious content as well. But I found myself wanting to just go on really long walks listening to it. So I I was doing something, but also like paying attention. And I listened to it on 1.25, actually, I think, for some part. It's funny that they're both audio, but like we don't treat them the same. So I was just curious. And kind of along those same lines, just continuing on this audiobook question trend, do you guys listen to fiction and nonfiction audiobooks? And do you listen to them in the same way? Because I I have a hard time with fiction. I'm mostly a nonfiction reader in all books. So it doesn't... It's true. You like your books about boats. I do like my books about random facts that I can give to the team and uh, really entertain the team in our meetings. (laughs) I think clouds was another trend that you got into for a little bit. went through a real... Yeah, I've got several books about clouds. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm also a big like nonfiction audiobook listener. For fiction, I find that it has to be a really good narrator. Otherwise, it really takes me out of the story. Um, So I haven't found too many fiction audiobooks that I enjoy. So if you have any recommendations for me, leave them in the comments. One that I really liked was um, Denise Mina. I listened to her audiobook of Conviction, but partly because part of the story is a podcast. Oh, or every that's other interesting. Every other chapter is a podcast episode. So when you're listening to it, it was actually quite fun because I, I read and listened to them at the same time. So maybe that's a cheat though, because it's fiction, but it's like... Well, maybe it's an entryway yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was good. I also have a recommendation. It's the only fiction audiobook I've ever finished. And it's called This Is How You Lose the Time War. And I will talk about this book until the end of time. It was so good. I like how I've secretly turned this into like a recommendation <laughs> podcast for me. <laughs> I thought you were going to recommend that city book again, Rachel. I'm like, I've heard you recommend that book like seven yeah. times. <laughs> I haven't listened to the audiobook of it. Okay. I've only read it. But The City We Became by N.K. Jemison is a phenomenal book. And apparently the audiobook is incredible, but I have not experienced it yet. Now that we're on this <laughs> recommendation train, I'll shift the question to what subgenres or genres in general do you think will stand out more in 2023? And what are you hoping to see also? In terms of kind of romance, we definitely saw a spike in paranormal, which I have to assume you guys can corroborate, is to do with like TikTok and the different sort of trends in in that sort of book, which I think is really interesting. Historical still doing well with sort of the tailwind from Bridgerton and doesn't seem to be kind of slowing down in any way. And then 
when we look at some of the other genres like mystery or thriller, I noticed an increase in sort of like the police procedural and especially with women's sleuths, which I guess has kind of to do with potentially like cozy mysteries that people like. Uh, they seem to be having a moment. And I think it's something nice about, you know, picking up a book and sort of knowing all of the beats to expect, but still being able to get lost in a story. So I suspect that those will keep increasing. What I'm curious about what will happen next year is because I think there's definitely been an increase in more active romance, which is code for uh, like erotica, as people, again, I think from TikTok, who are just sort of wanting more of that darker romance and stuff. But I'm curious to see if that will also spill over into like darker thrillers and stuff like that. Because I know like those always exist and are like thrillers and mysteries and, you know, suspense stuff in general is always really popular, but I'm kind of curious if there's like an overlap there and like the darker content. Just kind of going off the TikTok mention, but I think we're going to see a continued, like, I don't think segmentation is the right word, but romance readers are really realizing what they like and they'll seek out books that have that specifically. So I think we're going to continue to see more specific categories being requested or being looked for by readers as romance readers start to like look more actively for the one thing they're looking at. Like you mentioned, more dark romance, alien romance, another book talk trend, paranormal romance. But I think one cool thing about the book talk community is that like romance is now something that people are more actively proud to talk about. And it's no longer like, oh, I need to hide my Harlequin novel in a magazine on the subway. So I think we're going to see a lot more requests for very specific romance genres. And uh, Laura, you're the romance reader in the room. Am I totally off base here? No, I was like naughty along with you. Totally agreeing. I think with TikTok, we're seeing a lot of people kind of discover reading again, who maybe weren't big readers before. And especially with romance, people are like, wait, these books exist. And it's not just like my grandma's like romance novels from years ago. I find a lot of people are discovering kind of backlist romance that was popular like years ago. It was kind of like coming back. And like you said, like people are discovering what tropes they're into and they're more open about what kind of tropes they like. And that's kind of helping discoverability. And I think that's where we're really seeing that paranormal romance that Tara mentioned. There's lots of people who are like, wait, there's werewolf books. There's vampire books. Like, give me more of that. Um, So, yeah, I think that's going to continue to grow for sure. And one other romance genre that I think might continue to grow is kind of like that small town, like Western romance. I think with like a Virgin River, we're probably still seeing kind of like the tail end of that. But also with Yellowstone and stuff like that, too, I feel like people are probably looking for more cowboys and that Western feel. So I'm interested to see if that continues to grow into 2023. Well, now that we've talked about the content of books that we might see in uh, 2023, let's talk about the covers. So what kind of cover trends did you notice this year and that you think will either change or continue into 2023? Well, before we started recording, I brought up this TikTok that I watched recently and it was talking about the like vector art kind of cartoony covers of romance. And like, we definitely saw a huge boom of that recently. And there's a lot of discussion around should it, or is it better suited for just rom-coms? Should it be used on steamier books? Is it misleading? But a lot of people are using that like cartoony cover. And so that's definitely a trend that I think we saw. And I'm curious to see if that continues or if something new emerges because romance covers tend to be really cyclical in what is popular. And so I'm kind of curious to see what goes next. Yeah, we were talking about this beforehand as well, about how with the more like darker romance, not necessarily darker romance, but again, I'll say the active romance becoming more popular, um, but with different platforms having sort of restrictions on stuff that you can advertise, um, definitely seeing people using more object covers, which definitely feels like something that was done a few years ago, um, like, you know, Fifty Shades style covers being used for books and stuff. So it's interesting to see that. And then also, I think that the paranormal ones are really like, they're almost like video game like, right? They're otherworldly in the covers. So it's kind of fun to see those different covers kind of pop up that aren't following like 
I guess they are following their own trends specifically, but they're not, they're very much like selling what the book is on the cover. Whereas not like with some of those um, animated covers, it can be a bit unclear. Like you assume this is a rom-com, but it might not be a rom-com. Yeah, I've definitely picked up some books where I assumed it's a rom-com and then it's like, whoa, this is steamier than I expected. I mean, I'm not complaining, but it's just like not what you'd expect from... um, Just like fanning yourself with shock. Yeah. (laughs) One thing I've noticed, and I don't know if this is necessarily new, but it's something that I've really noticed recently, is a lot of the fantasy romance covers have been starting to kind of look a little bit more fantasy-y. So like text and vines and like really leaning into the more fantasy element rather than the torsoed hero on the front cover. But there's still plenty torsos, still team torso over here, you know? Plenty of torsos. Yeah, I'm personally interested in seeing the illustrated cover, not the kind of like vector or silhouette art that we were talking about earlier, but in a lot of why a, at least in traditional publishing, they tend to get, you know, custom art commissioned of the characters in the books to put on the cover. And I have seen some of that in indie publishing as well. And I'm interested to see if that picks up in 2023 when people realize, oh, there are, you know, plenty of artists we can work with out in the world to get, you know, beautiful covers drawn and designed for the books that are coming out. I'm thinking like specifically of when I read this year, um, Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry, which started out as a indie book and then became, you know, he got a book deal with Tor. And the cover, I believe, if I'm correct, he like commissioned himself when he was self-publishing it. And uh, it's really beautiful, like a really beautiful fantasy cover. And I'm, yeah, I'm just interested to seeing if people go down that path a bit more next year as the demand kind of picks up for that kind of cover. I have a question for the class. There was this, and it's still kind of going like a huge trend on Instagram where people are using AI to create. That's exactly like, different... what I was going to say. Yeah, we're on the same wavelength. Perfect. Yeah. Do you guys think that AI cover art is uh, coming soon? It's interesting, like the legality of that is kind of funny, right? That you own the copyright for that and you can use it. I'm sure it definitely, maybe it would be like part of the cover. I don't know if people would use it for like a whole cover or anything, but yeah, I. it's interesting to even get ideas to then use that to commission something else. But I think it's a blurry rights world. <laughs> uh-huh, I agree. And I know there has been some discussion about the blurriness of the legality when it comes to what art they're using to train the AI. Exactly. Yeah. But I think, I don't know, like advances in AI as of late have been extraordinary. So I'm really curious to see. Laura, what do you think? Yeah, I was just thinking about that too. It's almost like creepy, all the stuff that AI can do. Like it kind of creeps me out in like a futuristic movie kind of way where it's going to like come alive and come after us. Um, It's inevitable. (laughs) But I think it's hard, like when it comes to something like a cover that's so personal to the author and to their story, I think it's really hard for AI to replicate that. Like I agree with Tara, I think it's you who mentioned maybe using it as a starting point or something like that. But I think that there's no way it can kind of replace the relationship between like the author and the cover designer in the same kind of way. Yeah, I could definitely see it for like, you know, say if you were writing like sci-fi or epic fantasy or something, and you probably have an idea in your mind of like, okay, I've got this goblin that wears a hat and he's got one green eye and one is a pigeon, you know, or something. Do you know what I mean? And just be like, what what does that look like? <laughs> Is this your next this story. nano project? Like <laughs> the goblin and the know. pigeon. Yeah. Something like that. You know, he's got a pigeon on his shoulder somehow. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see the visuals. So like, I don't know, would that help with you writing it? Or maybe as an, well, you can tell I'm not a writer, right? You probably know what that looks like already in your mind when you're describing and writing that. Can we put that image into an AI generator to see what comes? <laughs> we'll include that in our show notes. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Terrence, you got to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I could see that as a directive, right? That like, oh, yeah, that idea is sort of interesting. And maybe you could work with your cover designer on that. But again, I, I don't know like how that works with the ownership part. So always, always uh, check legalities before you do any of this. I mean, I think you do own the rights or you can, but worth checking. Everything is changing so fast. Kara from Kobo said. 
<laughs> Check yeah. with your lawyer, everyone. <laughs> yes, please. Cool. I think the next topic I wanted us to touch on is marketing, because I think it's it's obviously always a hot topic, like how to market your book, what ways you can market. But what do you think we might see be the next big way to market your book or some new way to market your your content in 2023? I mean, I think that TikTok is going to continue. Sorry, Laura. You know, I love TikTok. But I think TikTok and book talk is going to just keep blowing up. I do know she loves TikTok because I get a lot of TikToks from her. <laughs> yeah, I agree with TikTok continuing to kind of like blow up and book talk continuing to grow in that kind of community. I was going to say that I think we're going to continue seeing authors using tools like Patreon and Kickstarter to kind of reach their uh, VIP reader and continue to connect with their biggest audience or their most loyal audience. For example, like using Patreon to kind of offer more exclusive content, like maybe like new fan art or like an exclusive edition of a book. Or I know um, when we interviewed Katie Robert, for example, she was talking about how she uses Patreon to um, release like specific chapters about new chapters about like characters that the subscribers vote on, like a couple they want to hear more from and that kind of thing. So I feel like we're going to continue to see that grow. I agree too. And I think that's something that will be really interesting in terms of like the TikTok and things like that is having it be like a wider audience of books, right? It's It seems to be quite like insular in, in the exclusive content. So it'll be interesting to see authors use it just in general for like books rather than it sort of directing to one place. I also think with tools like um, Book Funnel continuing to update and offer new aspects, I think we're going to continue to see authors use more of that to um, sell their book in different ways in their newsletter as well. Yeah, speaking of like the author newsletter, I have like almost 10 years of experience working in bookstores. And I was thinking a lot about how I would love to see authors kind of get inspiration from booksellers in physical bookstores in the sense that uh, hand selling, like really targeting the way that you're talking about a book to make it sound as, you know, personal and as if you're talking to a customer or even like a friend as possible. I really like that way of marketing. Um, and I think it really suits the author newsletter. Like you can make it a really kind of conversational thing. It's kind of hard to explain now that I'm realizing, but when you're, when you know, when you work in a bookstore and you're approached by someone who's looking for recommendations, you don't really take on a salesman kind of approach. It's more like you're recommending a book to a friend. It's very personable. It's very fun. It's a very enjoyable experience. I, I hope for both the <laughs> the bookseller and the customer. And I feel like with the author newsletter, that's something that you can really, really do there. Um, especially if, you know, you have dedicated readers, like the kind of people who are, you know, that small group that's always opening your newsletter. You can see it in your in your stats. Yeah, I just, I really like the hand slang approach. And I think there's a great example of, of how to talk about books in the way that a bookseller does on Literary Hub. They have a series called The Art of the Hand Sell that I would really recommend people check out. Well, just kind of to bring it back to TikTok, I think that's a really interesting part of the book talk platform is that it's authors being able to engage and somewhat hand sell their books to be like, oh, are you a fan of X, Y, and Z? Well, then you would really like my book. And then on the flip side, it's also an opportunity for people to talk passionately about the books that they love to their own community, because it's like, We've interviewed several authors on the podcast who have had a book go viral on TikTok. And a lot of the time it's because of the hand sell of a fan and they talk about it. And then another person with a big following was like, oh, I'll read that book. And then they talk about it and it just snowballs. So I think that the art of hand selling is something that is really becoming big on TikTok. It's really cool. And I think a large part of that is kind of what we mentioned before about people being more open about what they like. Like it's being able to search on TikTok, like the certain trope that you like and then finding books to read off of that. And then being able to see people say like, this book is great if you like enemies to lovers, uh, like there was only one bed, billionaire romance. And you can kind of just like, 
find if you'll like the book just based off of those tropes. I mean, I build my to be read list on book talk a lot just by looking at the different tropes that people list. And I even see authors doing that on Twitter now too. Like if you're not on TikTok and just like breaking down what the tropes are in their book. And I find that really helpful or even putting it on their website as well. And just like categorizing their books off of tropes. Like why not? I think a lot of people look for something really specific in their reading list and you can always find them that way. My last question was going to be on TikTok and book talk in general, but I feel like we discussed it throughout. <laughs> I can continue episode. to talk about TikTok until the end of time. So. Yeah, if you, if you want to hop in, I think... Don't get her started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask, where do you think it will go next year? Like if your wildest, <laughs> wildest idea of where TikTok and book talk might head for, you know, indie publishing or whatever we've been talking about here today. What I think has been interesting about Book Talk is that it's given a much more wide audience to indie authors and a lot of readers who were previously only getting like print books from a bookstore or were looking for a certain publisher are now being exposed to the world of indie publishing and are finding other ways to find tropes they like, books they like. And I also think it's going to be really interesting to see how traditional publishers try to keep up with the indie momentum on book talk. I just think of like the music industry, for example, and how now it's like, oh, your song's got to go viral. And so I'm really curious to see how TikTok affects the traditional publishing marketing. There's a lot of verbs in there of books because trad publishing tends to be a couple steps behind indie authors when it comes to marketing and getting especially word of mouth marketing. So I'm really curious to see what happens there. I love seeing indie authors take advantage of TikTok because I think for a long time, it was really like, it was hard for them to have an equal playing field with a lot of the big five publishers because it's like, I don't have this like marketing budget that I can throw behind books, but The word of mouth that authors are getting from TikTok and like the new audience they're finding, like you can't replicate that with like a marketing budget. Like that's something they're not paying for. That's just an author who loves a book and is talking about it and going viral. And a lot of publishers are trying to replicate the like going viral, but you can't do that. So it's I like it. And I hope we continue to see authors kind of grow their platform that way. I can only assume what you're saying is true because I'm not on TikTok <laughs> yet. <laughs> Hashtag get Tara on TikTok. No, I don't have the self restraint to uh, to limit my time on that. So I... but the dog videos you're missing out on, Tara. I, who Look, said we have self restraint? Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's fair too. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. This was a really fun conversation, and I feel like we covered a lot. <laughs> which is great. So yeah, here's to, well, when this is posted, it will be 2023, but right now it's December. So here's to 2023. I'm looking forward to the new year. Yeah. And authors, if we get it wrong, or if you agree or disagree with us, let us know. <laughs> We're happy to chat more. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're looking for more tips on growing your self-publishing business, you can find us at kobowritinglife.com and be sure you are following us on socials. We are at Kobo Writing Life on Facebook and Twitter and at kobo.writing.life on Instagram. This episode was hosted by Rachel Wharton, Laura Granger, Tara Kremen, and Terrence Abrahams with Terrence also doing production. Editing was provided by Kelly Robotham. Our theme music was composed by Tear Jerker. And thanks to the team for taking time to chat with us. If you are ready to start your self-publishing journey, sign up today at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.